I have an outrageously large collection of Warhammer Fantasy miniatures, and it all dates back to when my brothers and I began collecting Warhammer together as children. Many childhood birthdays and Christmases went into building our armies, but in the 23 years since, they've grown even more. But now, with rumblings that the Warhammer Fantasy universe is coming back with Warhammer The Old World, there's renewed interest in Warhammer Fantasy. Now, if you know me, you know I hardly need an excuse to get involved in an outrageously large Warhammer project, but I figured this was the perfect time to finish off my armies. So today, we're going to see if we can answer the question, can I paint every Warhammer Fantasy army in just 24 years? In these tubs behind me is my Warhammer Fantasy collection. And I think the best thing that we can do to start this project is to pull out each army one by one and see where they're at right now. And of course, we'll set up some cool terrain to match each army. Luckily, my brother Kirk is here to help. First up is Orcs and Goblins. They weren't my first ever Warhammer models, but Orcs and Goblins were my first proper Warhammer army when my brother and I split the Warhammer Fantasy 6th edition starter set which features Orcs and Empire soldiers. A lot of them were painted when I was a kid, some of them were retouched when I was in university, and I've slowly added a bunch of things to them over the years as well. I think they're my biggest army, and it's full of fun little kit bashes and conversions and dumb things that I did when I was a kid, and they have a really fond place in my heart. Look at this Snotling Pump Wagon for example. I made a banner for it when I was in 6th grade, and I called it, of course, the Shaggin' Wagon. Luckily I've grown up somewhat since then, I guess. Overall, it definitely needs some touch-ups and there's a solid amount of points that look halfway decent, especially if you stand 20 feet away and squint. Hell yeah. Next up, Kirk's childhood army, the Lizardmen. From the steaming jungles of Lustria, the Lizardmen are another army that holds a really special place in my heart. So while we set up some jungle terrain, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor, Into the AM. Into the AM makes cool, elevated graphic t-shirts that you can work into your everyday wardrobe. Right now, Into the AM is running a bundle deal so you can get three t-shirts for $60. The shirts are super comfortable and they're handcrafted by a team of skilled artisans. They sent me some to try and I'm really impressed with the quality. I can really see these becoming a part of my everyday rotation. They've got tons of great designs. You can see I'm wearing one. Kirk's wearing one as well. And uh, let us know in the comments who looks better. But if you say Kirk, I'll delete your comment. So click the link in my description and you'll get 10% off your order. Thanks into the AM for sponsoring this video. Lizardmen are one of those quintessential retro Warhammer armies for me. As part of the starter set when we first got into Warhammer towards the end of 5th edition, they represent a particular period in Warhammer where things were brighter and a bit more fantastical. Our Lizardman army needs a lot of work in places though. Much of it was painted by my brothers when we were quite young and it hasn't been touched That's up the since. Thing, is nobody of all our brothers remembers consciously deciding that blue and yellow was the choice, but the army got painted blue and yellow. And we've had these conversations where it's like, oh, I thought you liked the blue and yellow. It's like, no, I, I never liked the blue and yellow. I thought you liked the blue and yellow. And somehow none of us liked the blue and yellow and the whole army got painted blue and yellow. The remainder are things that I've picked up since, some of which are nicely painted, some of which still need to be finished or touched up, and some of which aren't painted at all. One of my favorite things we did for this army that we've done on other armies since is we put the flying pterodons on long clear plastic stands so they can soar over the jungle canopy. I think that's really cool. We've also built a bunch of cool temple city terrain and jungle terrain over the years that I really enjoy. Overall the jungles of Lustria are one of my favorite settings and the Lizardmen are just such a cool faction to me that'll never get old. Next. Let's take out some more trees to make something resembling the enchanted forests of Athelorn, because it's time to enter the realm of the Wood Elves. Wood Elves were the first Warhammer Fantasy minis I ever saw, and a box of Wood Elf Archers were the first minis I ever bought. And to this day, I think the 5th edition era of Wood Elves are some of the most wonderful and charismatic designs the Games Workshop has ever made. It still reminds me all these years later of how it made me feel at the time, like the classic fantasy stories and tropes that I grew up with were coming to life on the tabletop. I won't go too much into this army, as I have a video that's a more in-depth dive into the Wood Elves and my Wood Elf army in progress as we speak. But suffice to say, this army is one of my all-time favorites. It's also one of the most presentable in its current state, though there is still some work to do to get it to where I want to be.
Next up, the haughty brethren of the Wood Elves, the High Elves of Ulthuan. I have a much smaller High Elves army and a much less intense connection with this army. My High Elves collection mainly consists of the elf halves of two of the Island of Blood boxes, the last starter box released before Warhammer Fantasy was discontinued. But for the last 10 years or so, I've also had custody of the High Elf collection of one of my friend's brothers, who painstakingly painted some of the units in the bright classic style of the 90s, before boxing them up to never touch them again all those years ago. Now I've asked my friend if his brother is interested in selling these to me, but the chances are he might want to give them to his kids one day. His kids are currently toddlers, so I think I'll have them for a few years yet. Which should give me time to replace the units that are my brother's friends, and bring this army up to the standard that it deserves. Because High Elves really are very, very cool. Next, let's look at one of the smallest armies currently, the Skaven. Currently, my built and painted Skaven force is quite small, consisting of a little more than a Mordheim gang, but I do have plans to expand it. I currently have the Skaven half of the Echoes of Doom box and a handful of other models still new on Sprue, and I plan to base them on square bases, as is just in fitting. I think that would be a great project for showing some quick army painting techniques, so look for that to be in the pipeline for a future video. I really like the idea of spending just a day or two and getting it all ready to a decent tabletop standard, and I'm itching to do that soon. Next up, let's go to the snowy peaks of the World Edge Mountains to look at one of my favorites, the dwarfs. First, to create an appropriately snowy setting, I'm going to apply some snow flock to my existing piece of waterfall terrain. You look a little tense. Why don't you chill out? That honestly looks better than I could have ever imagined. Now, the dwarves are not an army that I collected as a kid, but one that since getting back into the hobby around 2015, I've slowly accumulated with purchases of used models. Now, the basis of this army was the plastic dwarves from the Battle for Skull Pass box, but bit by bit, I've added units of rare and special metal models that I can find when I get a good price. I love how many unique and characterful sculpts there are in the dwarf range. I really like how they look on the snowy battlefield as well. It's very satisfying to see them all laid out like this. This army and many of the others in this video have never been mustered in their current form at full strength on a nice looking table before, and I have to say it's absolutely inspiring. Let me know down in the comments if you think dwarves should get more love on this channel. Next up, while we're still in a snowy world, let's take a look at my collection of Chaos Demons. Now these models are all on round bases, and I bought them from my friend fairly recently. But I think if I were to rank them up on movement trades, they'd still work for Warhammer Fantasy. My friend Trent explained to me at Adepticon this past year that this was the signature move of thrifty kids in his hobby circle when he was young. An army of demons could be used in both Warhammer 40k and Warhammer Fantasy. So having them on round bases with movement trays allowed you to get twice the bang for your buck and allowed you to play both systems. Since I of course play Warhammer 40k as well, I'm going to follow this logic and do the same thing, leaving them on rounds but putting them on movement trays when I need to for some Warhammer Fantasy action. Next up, Dark Elves. Dark Elves are another army that I did not collect as a kid but have been slowly accumulating, and as you can see, the army does need a lot of work. I've managed to snag tons of really cool models, metal chariots, Marathi on a dark pegasus, cold one riders, a manticore, a hydra, all of the units that caught my eye in white dwarf as a kid, and I'm really glad to have them now. Again, this could be a great candidate to show some speed painting techniques in an upcoming video. I think they're one of the cooler looking armies, and I'm really excited to give them some more love and bring them up to standard to use on the table. Next up, the Beastmen. The Beastmen got a big range refresh a few years ago into 6th edition, and I was really taken in by their new aesthetic. With their savage warriors, shamans, trolls, and ogres, it kind of felt like a more mature version of orcs and goblins, which as you know was my first army. And because there's a lot of carryover, it was easy for me to start this as a second army. So you can see my giants doing double duty in this army as chaos giants, and my, and my river trolls in there as chaos trolls as well. 
What really made this into a full army is a few years ago I was given somebody's old Beastmen collection, which features some of the old character full 5th edition models which are really nice too. A few years ago I picked up a bag of unpainted dragon ogres for a great price, so I think that'll probably be my next project for this army when I get around to it. Next, Vampire Counts. Those of you who watch my channel probably recall that a few months ago I did a video on my Vampire Counts army, which I'll link here. And since then, I've done a few things to update it, but I'll save those for another video. As it stands, it's probably my best looking Warhammer Fantasy army currently. I can field well over 3000 points painted to a fairly high standard, which is more than I can say about many of these armies. Currently, I do have something spooky and Vampire Counts related planned for October, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. Next up, the Empire. This army was the bane of my existence as a child, because it was the army that my eldest brother played. He was always more tactically focused than I was, so my orcs suffered a lot of defeats to this force. At the time, I hated this army and its aesthetic, but it's really grown on me over the years, and I've become arguably more mature and more learned in history. The human factions appeal to me more and more. The army itself is mostly painted quite simply. My brother was not fussed with fancy highlights or shading, and instead focused on applying clean and opaque colors to his army so that they'd look good on the table as game pieces. I painted the Emperor on the Griffin for my brother as a kid, and I touched it up recently. The army has the distinction of being the first army that was fully painted in our family, and that simple paint job ethos was a big part of that. Sure, they could be elevated with a few touch-ups or washes here and there, but these bad boys are ready for the table right now, and they have been for years. Next, we cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. First, let's set up the table. Kirk and I have always liked the idea of a conquering force of mercenaries coming to Lustria to attempt to loot the wealth of the temple cities. So I made a cheeky little water feature by adding some gloss mod podge to a piece of blue bristol board and adding it to the corner of the table, then pouring down some sand to make a beach. With the sand added, I put this cog ship from Zeterides in, then set up the dogs of war like they're landing on the beach. Now some of these guys are obviously in need of some restoration work, and you may notice the Wood Elf Lord doing double duty in this army as a mercenary dragon, which is pretty cool. Also, if you look closely over here on the right flank, you might notice the smallest army on this list, which I didn't give its own section, so if you're hoping to leave a mean comment saying that I don't actually have every Warhammer Fantasy army, then I guess this is your opportunity to do that, because those eight ogres are currently the closest thing that I have to an Ogre Kingdoms army. But, you know what, Ogre Kingdoms was a fairly late newcomer to Warhammer Fantasy, so I'm not too fussed about that. Check out this shot through the jungle to the invading force. Damn. It's so sick. I love Warhammer Fantasy so much, guys. Next up, Chaos Warriors. Warriors of Chaos were basically the big hot thing when I was young. In 6th edition, they gave the whole Chaos range a glow up, and the new models for Chaos Warriors were really strong in the game, and they were great designs. In hindsight, they probably then understood the need for a Space Marine-like faction of elite troops that you can paint whatever color you like, and I think the Chaos Warriors are a great fit for that. In this army is a converted dragon made from the old Egrim Van Horseman model that I made in first year university. I had an old copy of the dragon from some friends caked in old red paint, and I used hand sanitizer from a dispenser on the wall and a shaker of salt from the cafeteria to strip off that old paint and I painted it in my dorm room. I've got fond memories of this guy and this army. I'd love to add a few models to this army from the modern Slaves of Darkness range, because generally they've kept the same aesthetic over the years since the 6th edition glow up. Just classic Warhammer Fantasy vibes that are awesome. Next, Bretonia. I've made several videos about my Bretonian collection over the past few years, and in the background I've slowly made some progress and additions, but I'm not going to show them here. Suffice to say, my Bretonian army is one of my favorites, and I have a lot of cool plans for them with the release of Warhammer The Old World. As it currently stands, I probably have about 2,000 playable points of Bretonians painted up nicely, and a bunch that's in progress, but you'll see soon. Next up, without a doubt the rarest army on the list, Chaos Dwarves. Now, I've been slowly accumulating Chaos Dwarves for a little while now. 
but as I mentioned, they are vanishingly rare and extremely expensive when you find them. Chaos Dwarves never received their own armies book or any mainstream releases since I've been into Warhammer. They were big in the 90s and then basically just disappeared, with one release in the form of the Hell Cannon at the end of the Storm of Chaos campaign in 6th edition, and then some Forge World releases later, but never with the same retro red big hat aesthetic that I really like. Now, despite their rarity, I have the start of a force coming together, and this is another army that I'm really excited to do in its own video. Don't forget to let me know in the comments which armies you guys are most excited to see in their own dedicated video, because it might help me decide which ones to prioritize. Last but not least, we have the Tomb Kings of Kemri. These Tomb Kings are an army that I cobbled together in about 2017, when I just got back into the hobby and found a great deal on some used out of print models. You can see that most of them still have the chestnut ink heavy paint job of the previous owner. I also made some improvised proxies for some of the units, like these Scarab Swarps for example. They're made from beads, cromlech vultures, and some scorpions from Reaper, but they look decent. This army is halfway between being presentable and ready for the tabletop and needing a bit of work. You can see I still have two of Shabdi to paint there in the back. And one of the Screaming Skull Catapults is actually an old orc rock lobber that's just kind of standing in. I have a huge interest in ancient Egypt though, and overall this is one of the armies I'm most excited about working on as Warhammer the Old World comes out. So. There it is, every Warhammer Fantasy army in its current state. As you can see, this is a huge project. And just to be clear, this project is mostly going to be focused on in the evenings when I'm hanging out with my wife at the kitchen table, just painting a mini here and there before bed. I know as viewers, some of you often express your frustration that I'm not more focused on one project and completing it at a time. But honestly guys, this is my process. This is how I keep everything fresh and how I keep my interest at peak levels to bring out as much cool content to you guys as I can. I'm not someone who abandons my projects, but it does take me a little while to get them done sometimes and I appreciate all of you for your patience and support, especially my Patreon patrons. If you want to support the channel, I'll put a link to my Patreon page down below. If you support me on there, you gain access to a Discord server where we talk about work in progress projects and all sorts of other things, and it's a really huge help to the channel. Thanks for tuning in guys, we'll see you next time on Eric's Hobby Workshop.